Luke chapter 15 is our chapter tonight. 32 verses, I believe. 32 verses, and it's going to move really fast. It's three stories, and we're going to read through the three stories, and, and then hang on at the end. I'm going to put them all together because they go together. Oftentimes, where they're pulled out and preached on separately, and that's okay, but really, it's all told to go together when Jesus told these three. It's really like one story with three parts. Chapter 15, verse 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And that's good. That's why we're here. All of sin to fall short of the glory of God. So we, we sinners have, have drawn together here to hear Jesus tonight, not just hear Taz, but hopefully hear the Lord speak to us. And the Pharisees and the scribes, the enemy, the perpetual enemy when he was walking the earth, they murmured, which is a King James word for they complained or grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, as a New Testament Christian, you know what I say to that church? That's one time that the Pharisees and the and the publicans, the scribes here, the, they got it right. They spoke the truth. They meant it in a bad way. Oh, oh he hangs out with the wrong crowd. This man, he eats and he fellowships with sinners. You know what I say about that? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, or I couldn't, I couldn't fellowship with you. And he spake this parable, so Jesus, in response to that. Now, this three-part story is in response to, look at him. He's hanging out with the wrong crowd. He's hanging out with tax collectors and all these kind of people that we don't have nothing to do with because the we who have nothing to do with them, they were the self-righteous bunch. They didn't think they were sinners. They didn't think there's nothing wrong with them. And as long as somebody's in that state of mind, they'll never come to a Savior because you got to realize that you need help before you go to the helper. You're completely lost and undone. And you, you find a Savior. But when they thought, well, we keep God's law so good that we're going to get in, and, well, they didn't have Paul, did they? That we got the rest of the story here that uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the uh, only hope is by grace through faith. So he spake this parable unto them, saying, verse 4, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds? So the first part of the story is about a lost sheep. You'll leave the rest of the herd, the rest of the flock, and go find that one, won't you? Of course. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, carrying it home. Rejoicing. He's happy. He found the sheep. He's happy. He's so happy, verse 6, that when he comes home, he calls together his friends. And he says, and his neighbors saying unto them, Rejoice with me. Well, what are we rejoicing about? I had this sheep that was lost, and I looked, and I looked, and I went over three ridges, and I found it in that holler down there in the thicket somewhere and I brought him home safe and said I'm going to have a party come and rejoice with me for I found my sheep which was lost so they all probably said yeah we'll be there what, what do you want me to bring we'll come and have a party too we'll celebrate with you and I say unto you that likewise in verse 7 there's some of these verses that follow the little story plots and it shows uh, that earth is supposed to be doing what they're doing in heaven that's what part of that means when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, when, when somebody, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself here. I say unto you, verse 7, that likewise, joy, now all through these stories you got rejoice, you got joy, you got party language, celebrate all through here. There'll be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. More than 99 persons who need no repentance. Moreover than the 99 just persons which need no repentance. And I already said this. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So why Jesus said over them 99 people that need no repentance? Because you and I know every human being that's ever born needs to repent. This is kind of a tongue-in-cheek answer to them Pharisees and publicans that's charging him here. He says, 
We'll rejoice more over that lost one that, that you don't want me hanging out with over here, coming and becoming a friend of Jesus, than you 99 over there that don't need no repentance. It was a tongue-in-cheek put down to them, see? Either what woman having 10, now the first one's a sheep. One sheep gets lost, so he goes and finds it. He brings it home. He calls his friends and he has a party. The second one's a woman that loses a silver coin. She had 10 coins. She lost one of them. She, same thing, same plot. Either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, boy, she's going to light a candle and sweep the house and look in every nook and cranny and look and see the wet before the floorboards and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, let's have a party. Come and rejoice with me, for I've found the peace which I had lost. And here's that little tag, like at the end of the other one. Likewise, there's now joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Now, what was their charge? He hangs out and parties with sinners. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, we're doing on earth what they're doing in heaven. And the first one the first story we read, the first part of this story, the man looking for the sheep is like, that's a type of God. It's like God looking for the one that was lost and comes back and rejoices over. And the second one, the woman that loses the coins like God. He searches diligently until he finds it and then everybody's happy and has a party. Verse 11. Now, probably 99 out of 100 Christians read this and they'll think, that's the end of that, and here's something totally different. But I'm going to show you this parable of the prodigal son is exactly the same plot line as the sheep and the coin. In this case, it's a man's got a son that gets lost, and he finds him, and he, he comes home, and he, he rejoices and has a party. Verse 11, he said, A certain man had two sons. He really had two sons. that had Both of them had problems, you're going to see here. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And they divided him unto him his living. It's almost like he said, I can't wait on you to die, Daddy. Go ahead and give me my part of the farm now. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. He must have sold his part. So he took a journey to the far country, and there he wasted his substance with righteous living. He parted down in the wrong way, the sinful way. And when he had spent all, now he's broke. There arose, and on top of that, the hard times come after he got broke. He went broke in the good times. Now the hard times come. There arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He, he signed on with somebody over there. Now, we could do a lot with that. He's, really, he, he's walking on the dark side now. He signed on with the devil, if you want to. He joined himself to a citizen of that far country, and he sent him to his fields to feed the swine or the pigs. Now, I'm assuming since these were Jewish people around Jesus that he was telling this boy they would have assumed would have been a Jewish boy, and that's a way of saying he sunk just about as low as you can sink. A Jewish boy is out there feeding pigs. Jews didn't have nothing to do with pigs. You said bacon or ham to them, it was unclean, and make them gag. <laughs> that's forbidden. It ain't the same for us, is it? So he joined himself to a citizen of that country. He went and he's feeding the pigs, but it gets worse. You think it can't get no worse, but it does. He's starving to death. He's slopping the hogs, and he thinks, they're eating better than me. For a little bit, I'd eat the hog slop. He would have fain. He would have liked to have filled his belly with the husk that the swines did eat. And no man gave unto him. Now, in other words, he just finally hit bottom, bottom, bottom. And, and I, I see this all the time. Folks don't let people hit bottom sometimes that need to just go ahead and hit bottom. Because as long as you prolong the agony and you can just kind of keep enabling them, if, if they maybe they don't ever hit bottom, or maybe it just takes them a lot longer to hit bottom. But this boy just hit the bottom bottom, and when he did hit the bottom, that's when he realized that if I'm going to get any help, it's coming from up there. When he came to himself, he hit bottom, he come to himself. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough in despair? And I'm per perish with hunger. I'm starving to death down here in the pig pen. And it reminded, he said, them people used to work for daddy up there. They didn't go hungry like this. 
And the light bulb went on over his head. Verse 18. He said, I will arise and go to my father. But he, his guilt and his shame kind of made him think, but I don't have any right to go back and be his son. Maybe he'll hire me. Maybe he'll let me work for it. I say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. By the way, we're not worthy to be called his son either on our own. We're made worthy by the blood of the Lamb, not on our own merits. So he says to his father, he says, I'm going to tell him, he says, make me as one of your hired servants. So let me be one of your employees in verse 20. And he arose and he, he came to his father. What do you reckon he was thinking? Golly, I hate to go see daddy. <laughs> You reckon when he that that servant that that uh, that citizen in that far country he talked to him first and he said to, to him says I'm gonna quit working for you and I'm gonna go back and, and see if I can work for my father and if I if stick with my type of making that citizen of the far country that is working of the devil don't you know what that fellow was telling him why you're crazy he ain't gonna take you back you just have to go up there and be full of all this shame and guilt, you just better stay down here and feed my pigs. <laughs> you ain't worthy to be a, his son no more. But he, he made up his mind and said, I'm going. But I know he still had a lot of fear and trepidation when he's on his way. <laughs> when he was yet a great way off in the, bottom, in the middle of verse 20, his father saw him. Uh-oh. But the father had compassion. And ran, that's not the boy running, that's the father running to meet his boy. Mm -hmm. And he fell on his neck, the father put his arms around him, fell on his neck, he hugged him and he kissed him. And the son said unto him, I know he is crying and just all broke up, said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. I, I, you did what I asked you to do, and I just blew it, and I wasted it, and you, I had it made, I was in your house, and look at me now, not even worthy to... Be your son anymore. Verse 22, but the father, but the father said to his servants, bring forth, and at this point that boy is still thinking, the next word out of his mouth is probably going to be my whip. <laughs> but he said, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring here the, the fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat and be merry. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate. For this, my son, was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. And he's found just like that coin or that sheep. Call the neighbors. Let's have a party and be merry. Verse 25, get a little tag on at the end of this story. Now his elder son. Now the elder son, I think the reason Jesus told this story, it was prepping for something that was about to happen among the Jews. The elder son, he was like these Pharisees and the publicans that didn't think they needed to do no repenting. They wasn't that kind of people. The elder son's one that stayed home and he worked sweating day and night doing what he was supposed to do. And now he sees this one coming home and he's mad. His elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh the house and he heard music and he heard dancing. Wasn't, wasn't Baptist, was it? <laughs> What's all that music? What's all that dancing down there? And he called one of his servants. He's out hoeing corn or something. What's all that music and partying's going on down there? I'm out here working. I'm in the fields. He called one of the servants and said, What are these things meant? And he said unto him, Your brother. Remember that. The servant said, Your brother is come. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him safe and sound. And when he should have been happy, and should have been joining the party and celebrating. He was angry. Now you see what Jesus is doing with the tag on this story? 
what's about to start happening real soon here in the timeline of history. The Jews that have worked really hard to keep God's law and everything, they see them disgusting Gentiles start coming in and filling up the church. They didn't think they needed no repentance. He's hanging out with them kind of people that's getting them followers of Christ now. I think that's who the older brother represents, first of all. He is angry and wouldn't go in. Therefore came his father and entreated him. In verse 29, he answering said to his, to his father. Now here's the angry old brother talking about the younger brother to his daddy now. He said, Dad said, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. At least he might have thought he had, just like the Jews thought that was perfect, didn't they? Self righteousness. Yet you never gave me a kid. Now you didn't ever give me even a little goat. You've killed the fatted calf for, for him that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son, not my brother, <laughs> your son, has come, which has devoured your living with the harlots, you killed for him the fatty calf, that, that unclean boy. And the father says in verse 31, he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. Everything I've got is yours. It was me, or it was proper that we should make merry. And be glad. All this happiness and joy and party language is in here. For this, and the father reminds him, this, your brother, not just my son, but your brother, he was dead and he's alive again. And he was lost and he was found. Now, here's how all these stories tie together in the big picture of things. It's one story or three segments of one story or three stories, as you want to call it, but one plot line and the plot line is the same in every one of them. Something was lost. Something valuable was lost. It was sought diligently for. And then it was found. And then there was joy and there was happiness. And everybody said, let's celebrate over finding that which was lost. Everybody's happy. Long, long ago in the Garden of Eden, man lost the most valuable thing that man had. We lost our righteousness when the original humans sinned, disobeyed God. And down through the corridors of time, we come to Calvary's cross, and by God's plan of salvation, Jesus found that righteousness for us again that can be imputed to us. His righteousness can be credited to us because he lived the life that we couldn't live and then took the punishment, the judgment of God upon himself. And now that's a good thing. It's a good thing that our righteousness is restored by grace through faith. And the third part of the story is now we're going to call everybody together and we're going to rejoice and we're going to be merry and it's going to be a celebration of that which we lost. Our righteousness has been given back to us. It's been found again. And that third part's what we call the Christian church. And according to Jesus' painting of that very picture right here in this chapter, that church should be a celebration of that. Church should be a joyous thing. Amen. It's fitting that before we had Bible study tonight, we had an ice cream party in the in, not in the sanctuary, but in the fellowship hall. Then we came in here to study God's word and pray and worship together. That all goes together. It's not really two things. It just merges together. The fellowship of the church, the party, the celebration, and then God's word. And that's a about as pure as it's painted for us in Luke chapter 15 here today. Let's pray together now. Lord, we do thank you for this wonderful chapter of the Bible that every Christian can say that I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was lost, but now I've been found. And we rejoice not only in our own salvation, but we rejoice every time we hear of somebody else that turns from sin and turns to the Lord. And we celebrate that. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.